Hello and welcome to the Xenothesis podcast. My name is Richard Acton. This is episode 15. We're covering chapters 9 and 10 from part 3 nursery of uh, Book One Dawn of Octavia Butler's Xenogenesis trilogy. And I'm joined, as always, by my co-host. Michael Ginka. Hello, everyone. Hello, Michael. How's it How's, going? Yeah, it's good. How are you doing? Um, <laughs> I good. hope you're doing yeah. well, better than what uh, Lilith is experiencing at the moment. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, I think uh, both uh, both Lilith and Joseph are in uh, a bit of a tough spot at the moment. <laughs> Especially Joseph with his uh, hmm. slight, uh, recently acquired PTSD. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yes oh, uh yeah i think uh, uh she's uh worried about what he's gonna think and he's just um in a complete shell shock <laughs> yes after a mind-blowing non-consensual sex uh yes that would that would seem to be uh, an accurate description <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> but to be honest i mean mm. um it does uh, in the chapter that we're gonna dis- uh, discuss in a second. Like he 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 does describe it the way we described it. That you no, know, it's if you bottled it up, it would be like the most successful drug. Ever. Shall we uh, talk about your prediction for this chapter? Sure. Yes. Um, so my prediction was uh, for chapter nine that. Joseph and Lilith are going to have this hard conversation about what happened uh, with Nikanj and what are the next steps to be taken from there. Uh, I think Joseph will be like, as we predicted, you know, be like, oh, never again, unless, you know, I agree, but don't let, I will not allow Nikanj to touch me ever again. Yeah, which uh, I think is uh, more or less exactly what he says. Yeah. Yeah. So let's get to it. Chapter nine mm-hmm. summary. So as I said, as we discussed earlier on, that you know, it's the chapter starts as we predict. You know, Joseph having a PTSD from what he experienced, unable to speak or interact with Lilith, trying basically internally process what the hell happened to him, and it took some time for him to uh, awaken. But when he did, you know, Lilith stayed beside him just until he sorts his feelings out. And understands what the hell happened to him, uh, you know. I can. Yeah. I, I. I imagine everybody would be in, in such a situation. Would you know need some time to process it? And um, uh, agreed. And Lilith here goes. You know, eventually starts a conversation, trying to explain what happened. You know, it was a neurosensory illusion, where you can't stimulate their nerves exact uh, directly. And what they felt, Nikanj could too, but I could not read what they were thinking. And the fact that is that it couldn't hurt them because it would feel the pain itself. So, hmm. and furthermore, which is an uh, an interesting addition there. We, we didn't I don't think we knew this before that I mean, we knew that Nikanj was experiencing what they were experiencing, but not necessarily that um, uh, it would be kind of unable to hurt them without also hurting itself. Maybe whilst connected in this manner. Yeah, maybe the connection is very direct, so that whenever the impulses are sent from whatever you know, human's brain, they also feel those impulses in a similar hmm. m- manner. So, but I remember there was this thing that Nikanj was experimenting with um, Lilith about, um, you know, how to modify her, but at the same time give her pleasure. If I remember yes. correctly. So hmm. in the same time, maybe it exp- you know is just. In the same time, maybe at the time it told Lilith about this, that you know, it whatever happens, you know, it, it will feel the pain equally. Hmm. hmm. Yeah. I, mean, I, 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 I can't remember whether or not it explicitly told us that last time it was doing this, but yeah, um, we have a some familiarity with the the process, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, for, and then Lilith goes on furthermore to tell Joseph that it did strengthen uh, him a bit. Um, but he will definitely regenerate faster as he, uh, you know, the same speed as she is. And, mm-hmm. you know, after some prolonged time, you know, we live waiting and she was just messing around eating and suddenly Joseph wakes up uh, from the, 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 the hypnosis or the trance he was in and he was like, oh, it's morning. You should go and, uh, uh, you know, get up and start um, getting ready. And, uh, you know, then conversation starts with Joseph asking the same questions that to which Lilith has already answered before about you know mm. like what what they experience um i mean he has 
good questions though after asking Lilith if she has done this before and then she goes you know well yes alone or with Nika and Jasmine and this sort of startles um, um, Joseph where he has then how can they I mean their nervous systems can't be like ours how can they make us feel what I felt and she was responds by pushing the right electrochemical buttons. I didn't claim to understand it. It's like a language that they have special gift for. They know our bodies better than we do. And this is interesting because this hmm. shows what actually um, that Joseph is really uh, you know a proper scientist because like he knows like their nervous system can't be like ours. And I think this is pretty valid point. Like how can they feel what we feel? Like how did they evolve to be able to? experience other species that have completely different evolutionary um paths right yeah yeah I mean, it's, it's it's definitely got it's quite a um, um intellectual type question right it's not really a uh he, he's as for it to be abstract type question right it, it's still um and it shows he's got his head screwed on right it's not yeah. uh too uh st stuck in in other areas of this uh, let's see yeah uh, um, I like Joseph. Yeah, I think he is. Um, I can imagine myself sort of. I imagine myself being him, in a way, right? Because mm. he is probably the closest to what sort of we imagine to be a scientist, closed uh, scientist in the situation that they are in, right? Mm. How mm. they would behave. So hopefully, uh, hopefully. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that, that's a good yeah, point. Yeah, but yeah, you just have a good point about this whole uh, thing with the the nervous system and so on. But yeah, so like, uh, which neurotransmitters and what whatnot happen to be m uh, mapped to which sensations and so on is something that's not likely to be a universal, right? It's something mm -hmm. that's likely to be, have somewhat arbitrary. Uh, have been decided on a somewhat arbitrary basis in, in our evolutionary past. So I suppose that comes back to what, what we mentioned before about the kind of experimentation that uh, Nikandra was doing mm -hmm. with Lilith. It's just about trying to figure out, you know, what what input yields what response, right? It's just sort of... Poke and probe and see what uh, happens. Yeah, yeah. It's like, well, I mean, if, if you've got some kind of black box, like a... You know, a microchip you don't know what the design of it is or a, you know, some some binary blob of code that you don't know what the, the output is you just sort of feed it whatever inputs you can see what it outputs and then try to map what's going on inside yeah it's the <laughs> process of elimination <laughs> but in the meantime you know it was sort of like at the end uh it was giving lilith pleasure so you know maybe it wasn't as bad as we imagine it to be yeah <laughs> No, well, I thought Lilith was kind of uh, like able to um, say, like, yes, that's okay, and no, that's not okay when uh, it's trying the different inputs, right? So, yeah, I mean, pretty much that's what sex is about, <laughs> where basically you, you know, you talk and then, oh, this is fine, this is not, and you <laughs> go from there. Yep. <laughs> this is, uh, I, I feel, I feel for Joseph, honestly. This is, uh, you know, and this is where he goes on, like, you know, where he freaks out, you know, asking why would Lilith allow to, uh, you know, touch them. She says, well, you know, it's for the changes. And also, it's not like she didn't enjoy it. Like, well, you know, so why, why, what's the problem here? Yep. Yeah, she's very kind of, um, uh, like, honest and upfront about that. That's just like, yeah. Um, you know, they gave me these, like, abilities plus... It gave me an nice. orgasm while giving me the sort of really so hey come on <laughs> <laughs> yep and <laughs> yeah, which you know i can see a point yeah i can see that very fun and then you know this is where you know joseph goes on you know like i that thing i i will never let it touch me again if i have anything to say about it and then he goes i've never felt anything like that in my life he shouted it makes her a little jump but she says nothing mm. If a thing like that could be bottled, it would have outsold any illegal drug on the market. It's literally cult. I'm telling you, it's like, if you could, you know, if the aliens came in, we'll give you in the mind-blowing orgasm, they'll be called immediately. There'll be people jumping onto that train as mm -hmm. quick as anything, like, honestly. Yep, uh, I definitely think that would be a thing. Yep. <laughs> uh, that'd be, yeah. <laughs> 
honestly. Yep. Yeah. Owen Curly Colts. Mm. Honestly, it's just it's mind blowing. Like the guy is like in the whole finish up was like it was I'm shell shocked, but hell I was the ride was worth it, basically. <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah, he seems to be, um, and I think he he may kind of, um, I don't know, come round to the experience because it, it, yeah, those two things are kind of juxtaposed quite harshly, right? It's like they're never doing that again, and then that was kind of an amazing sensation. <laughs> it's like it's like, oh, I'm never doing it again. Oh no, no, mm, I'm not doing this ever again. And it's like you know, playing a um, uh, untouchable, and then yet wanting wanting more, basically. Playing hard, hard to get. Playing hard to get. That's what. That's what I, was, uh, I think I'm thinking of. <laughs> hmm. But to be honest, to be fair, he didn't have full. Co- he didn't provide full consent to this. So, I think. Yes. I think at some point there's gonna be this situation is gonna go back again. That like you no, know, Nikanj and Joseph meeting again, and it's just like, well, did you? And Nikanj would be like, oh, did you enjoy it? And he'd be like, yes, but when as well. Well, if you enjoyed it, what's the problem? It's like, well, I didn't have anything to say about this. Come on. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I think it will definitely be interesting to see subsequent interactions between those two because, uh, yeah, I think um, Joseph will probably still be a bit pissed off about this initial encounter. Yeah. I'm sure it's going to be like, you know, Joseph sort of imagined it to be um, just with Lilith, right? Hmm. And whereas it's not really gonna happen because Lilith is part of part of um Nikanj's um family, right? So Effectively that seems to be what they consider her, yeah. So it's basically either all of them or none of them. Quite possibly. And as we know, you know, uh Lilith is uh if they've wanted to have children, Lilith will not give any children unless she, you know, wants to have, and then the country will have to unlock that whatever contraceptive, biological contraceptive is there inside of her. Whatever yep. it's and stopping her it, to get pregnant. It will almost certainly be on their terms. Yes. And um, as she said before, a, a not entirely human child. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Although, you know, Nikon mm. says it's, you know, this whenever she wants to have a, ch- ch- a child, you no. Know, it's her choice, and it's you know that's mm. when she'll you know she'll be fertile again. But I yes. think the child, as you say, is going not going to be fully human. There's gonna be a mix. Yeah. So, so if if she ever decides she's willing to do that, then she will be permitted to do so. But, yep. Uh, but then the. If not, then. But yeah, so then Lilith, I think, changes the topic because she realized that the, Joseph is like, what he does, he's not sure what the hell is going on. So she changes the topic to go out, you know, saying that she's going to awaken 10 more people and ask if Joseph is still willing to help her. And of course, he agrees, but he goes back to the topic to Nikanj, whether this experience is, you know, like a drug and whether Lilith is addicted. And, you know, she answers that mm-hmm. no, she just enjoys it. Like, I mean, like, you know. Some people are addicted to sex, but hey, it's not like, you know, everyone is. But to be mm. honest, she didn't really want to have Nikanj there, and she would prefer to be with just Joseph. And this is the conversation that breaks up between him. I don't want him to hear again. Uh, goes, Nikanj isn't a male, and I doubt whether it really cares what either of us wants. Don't let him touch you. If you have a choice, keep away from him. The refusal to accept Nikanj's sex frightened her because it reminded her of Paul Titus. She did not want to see Paul Titus and Joseph. It isn't male Joseph. What difference does it make? What difference does any self-deception make? We need to know them for what they are. And if there are no human parallels, and believe me, there are none for the Uloi. And the chapter ends pretty much with Lilith leaving, leaving him without giving him any answer to that question, whether he, she, will allow, she will not allow Nikanj to touch her ever again. Hmm, hmm. Yeah, that's uh, interesting because I think uh, yeah, I think Lila has no intention of making that commitment, so she doesn't. Um, and yeah, I think she may suspect that Joseph might come around on that point at some point as well. Oh, I'm pretty so. sure he will. If you know, if hmm. if he's saying that this is like it, this drug would have sold any other drug on the market if it was bottled up, I'm pretty sure anybody would jump on that bandwagon. I mean, given enough time, yeah, and the given fact enough likely time to be possible. kind of yeah. confined with them, it seems a, a fairly inevitable outcome, right? I mean, they're going to get bored, right? 
get bored and do nothing or get bored and have a mind blowing orgasm. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> That's a, such a difficult yeah. uh, choice in here, hey? <laughs> hmm. Although I think um, Lilith's point about um, addiction is probably legitimate in that, in a, and, and her reasoning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. She was perfectly happy to to you know just be with Joseph and didn't really want Nakanj present. Is an uh, uh, honest assessment there. To be fair, I mean, like you know, it's it's always with any sort of pleasure things, right? Like it's fun, right, hmm. to a certain degree, and then you get bored or you try to get new sensations i mean that's why people some people like you know especially addicted to adrenaline right they try mm. more and more daring things because the usual thing doesn't give them the adrenaline boost that they used to have right so it might be yeah. a similar yeah. thing here like you know oh yeah it's a mind-blowing orgasm oh it's great again again but like you want something different right maybe some different yeah. experience yeah. every so often. and even if it's not sort of inherently chemically addictive in some sense, yeah. then it can still be psychologically addictive oh, yeah. in that you know, the, the right set of reward pathways get stimulated and so on. I mean, pleasure it's, is uh, addictive. Why are we play, you know, yeah, addicted yeah. to so many things and are like things that provide us with entertainment? Why is entertainment so addictive? Because we wanted entertainment, right? Hmm. That's, I mean, like, yeah, it's a- since the existence of internet, right? Like people oh, yeah, find yeah. other so much entertainment, they are overwhelmed with it. I mean, in mm. long past when there was no one much of entertainment, what did people do? If you know, if you lived in some sort of village, remote village, and you only did was like trying to survive, right? The only entertainment mm-hmm. was to having sex. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm. So yeah. and that also, I mean, like go back to the medieval era. You know, it's like cat burnings and all kinds of random stuff like that. It's just. I mean, you know, the entertainment gets weird. Yeah, entertainment. Have- yeah, <laughs> I mean, people had entertainment of the medieval people was like watching people getting, you know, uh, publicly punished for something, right? That was like people mm-hmm. going in this town circles or town square, whatever you call it, mm-hmm. and then watching people getting, you know, thrown rocks at or hanged or whatever. Like, hey, and then there's, you know, what sort of and people often blame games for violence. What sort of games do people in medieval times were playing to uh for such <laughs> violence, eh? Yeah, yeah. Now you're only torturing Minecraft cats, <laughs> not real ones. Exactly. <laughs> you know, I can fulfill my psychotic needs, you know, in a game without um <laughs> translating them in real life. What else do you want? <laughs> There's a great great video uh, of somebody just or somebody posted on the internet of like seeing their um, spouse or uh, I don't know who it's like it's the the second you know the, their spouse like and they're playing VR hmm. and they're just smacking some character's head over the wall over and over right <laughs> hey I mean yeah oh, it is dear. a psychotic behavior but as long as in the mm-hmm. game and the person relaxes huh be my guest <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How did we get yeah. to this tangent, by the way? Uh, well, yeah, we were kind of talking about uh, entertainments and addiction. Oh, yes. <laughs> swerved a little bit sideways. But yeah. yeah. Mm. But yeah, that, that kind of uh, just like random sporadic reinforcement for rewards is kind of the core thing that gets people hooked on stuff. It's like the whole slot machine mechanic, mm. right? It's uh, you might get a reward at random and that's what causes that kind of behavior. I mean, you see even in like um, uh, Skinner's famous experiments on pigeons Mm -hmm. where the pigeons developed superstitious behavior because they were being rewarded at random and they were trying to figure out what caused them to be rewarded Uh effectively. Uh So they do whatever it was they were doing at the time they received the reward. Mm -hmm. So like you get a pigeon that would like turn three times counterclockwise and like nod its head to the left or something silly like (laughs) that. And because it thought that that was what was causing it to get like a food pellet when it pushed this button really? but it was just purely random yeah wow yeah. that is such an interesting <laughs> thing you know mm-hmm. but that really explains sort of so, some sort of um behavior in humans as well if we can't figure out something like usually you know because it happened by random chance a lot of people jump into the strange conclusions don't they yeah yeah you just you mimic exactly what it is that you saw previously produce the effect um in fact humans also do um uh something called over imitation so if we see another person do something um and there's a bunch of steps in there that seem to be like kind of random and pointless and not have anything to do with the outcome Mm 
mm-hmm. a lot of animals will like be able to sort of s- skip the stuff that isn't relevant to the task yeah if they're doing some kind of imitation the smarter ones but humans over imitate so even if it seems completely arbitrary we will do exactly the same thing as the person who showed it to us because i think we have this kind of inbuilt like uh um chesterton's fence thing where if, if we see it being done we assume there must be a good reason for it to be done even if it doesn't if we don't get it uh, that- that reminds me of the elevator experiment where people would, um, a person, a random person would walk into the elevator and then a group of volunteers would walk into the elevator and all of them suddenly changed the direction they were facing. And often people <laughs> just, like random people were like, what the hell? And they would do the same. Yeah. yeah. They assume that there's a good reason for doing whatever it is that other people are doing yeah. and just do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's really weird because, like, it's, it's really funny because this experiment, it's been shown, like, there's some videos of it on YouTube, YouTube uh, I think. But, like, basically people suddenly just turn around and face that person and the person is like, oh, what the hell? And they just turn around as well, <laughs> thinking that well, even though there's no door at the back, they just do it. It's like, <laughs> why? Uh, you have yeah. to have really strong will and self sort of, um, I don't know, like self yeah sort of a willingness to to stand out yes from the group. yes it's yes the, to, to, the, to fight the, i mean that other famous psychological experiment with the the lines where they um there's like three lines on a board and you're asked which one is the longest and the they put individuals in a room where the whole the whole of the rest of the room is stacked with ah, collaborators of yes, the experimenter yes i know which one and about. they all say like you know line number three is the longest when line number one is clearly the longest and most people will just like capitulate and say that the socially acceptable answer that is clearly obviously wrong is the correct one. It takes very like very few people will actually like sit there and just go, uh, you know, you guys are all of you people are clearly wrong. Yeah, you guys are idiots. <laughs> obviously, this one is wrong. It's just, yeah, you have yep. to have really strong sort of um, uh, individualism to to self individualism mm. be- feeling that to to fight. That sort of tooling to stick out. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting. It's very interesting. Um, but it also proves this in this in this book that like all those people that um, uh, you have Lilith who's saying telling them, well, there's aliens, right? And she sticks with it, and she continues to stick mm-hmm. with it, right? Because obviously she knows it's truth. But everybody else like, no, no. Yeah. And, uh, well, I mean, it seems like some of them are willing to accept it or at least Some. provisionally so Some, yeah but yeah it's uh hmm. but i mean like well maybe it's not the best example here but like the, it, it just feel like this it's but i think it's a similar feeling that being this one person isolated person keeps saying hmm. this is what it is and people keep like fighting that back yes yes i agree well should we go to the chapter 10 prediction there's one more uh-huh. little thing i wanted to note on. On, during this chapter because there's quite a lot of um quite a lot of dialogue yes in this chapter yeah um and i just want to say that i think that the dialogue is is quite well written in this and in you know, throughout the the book but because the, there's a lot of um i noticed it more kind of acutely here because there's so much dialogue in this section but mm-hmm. you know there's a lot of pauses there's some sentence fragments that you know sort of use of ellipses and like trailing endings and you know very it, it produces quite a a realistic impression of dialogue. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, which uh, is quite hard to write, I think. Um, no, I see what you mean. Yeah, it's it's more. It literally feels like a proper dialogue instead of you know, oh, I am doing this. Oh, I see, and it's just like you know this very sort of blocky mm. like um, conversation. Yeah, there's there's interaction, yeah, so interruptions, and you know you can see like people's. The flow of people's thoughts in the in the way that there's there's pauses and breaks and partial sentences and yeah. stuff, and that um, yeah, so it's just just wanted to note that that's that's uh, well done because that is a, a realistic reflection of how people talk, right? We yeah. don't talk in perfect sentences. Yeah, yeah, which, yeah you know, absolutely. If somebody ever bothered to transcribe these podcasts, I'm sure we'd be appalled. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, uh, to be when you say that, when I look at um, the captions on YouTube that are automatically mm-hmm. generated, that algorithm is doing pretty well, more or less. All right. um, although it does sometimes um, have some really weird and funny 
like interpretations of what we say. To be honest, I think mm. it mostly usually have problems with my uh, voice when I'm speaking, maybe because of my mix of multiple different accents. Yours mm. is usually much clearer and it is easier for it to interpret what you're saying. Yeah, there's, um, uh, there's a definite bias with speech recognition algorithms and being able to successfully interpret like British and American English and anything that's even remotely different. Yeah. So like Scottish people famously have a great deal of difficulty <laughs> with like Alexis and stuff. Oh my goodness, yeah. <laughs> Uh, there's so many uh, funny videos about you know people Scottish people yeah. trying to ask Alexa or do anything mm -hmm. voice recognition is brilliant. Speaking of elevators, there's a great sketch on um, uh, what's that? Let me show. No, it's about is the it? two Scottish guy that. going to the elevator. Two Scottish guys in an elevator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw yeah. it. <laughs> Yeah, it's a voice recognition elevator, which is why it doesn't work for them. But um, <laughs> yeah, things get out of hand fast. It's very funny. Google for like Scottish people elevator. Yeah, we'll see it. it is anyway, really funny. right, let's, let's um, go back. Right, so chapter 10 prediction. Return. Right, so 10 new people are awakened. This is my prediction. Then some st bad stuff is going to happen. By stuff, I mean something, someone's going to get harassed or attacked because, you know, whatever, the people are being just awakened and some random people are saying, oh, hi, we are actually being held by aliens. And they're like, uh, okay, you weirdo. And then, you know, some really bad stuff is going to happen. Okay. So. The chapter 10 starts with um, 10 more people being awakened, as we were you know, told. And um, everybody mm -hmm. was being busy, trying to keep the new out of people out of trouble. Although, you know, some people are like, you know, laughing in the faces, you know, people when they're told they're being kept like aliens. And some people, as I mentioned, actually do attack us. And in this case, we have a man named Ray Ordway uh, attacking mm -hmm. Leah, possibly trying to rape her. But with help of Gabriel, she manages to stop him. But a few days later, she they're all sleep they were sleeping with each other with full consent on each side so i mean the book describes leah being like you know a bit amused by his behavior but it seems like she didn't really bother was really bothered by his behavior and suddenly hmm. and i think the um when you first wake up from the the plant thing you're pretty kind of disorientated yeah and it it says in the text that kind of when people what people did when they were first woken up was kind of like ignored to a certain degree by the group because I, I assume they experienced the same kind of disorientation yes, yes. when they first woke up. So they're like, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll give you a pass on your behavior, like immediate initial behavior once you're waking up from the pod, um, which seems fairly reasonable. Yeah, I guess, you know, whatever the experience must have been, you know, before just before being put to sleep you know must have been enough traumatic for them to uh to you know when they wake up you know still those emotions um, or the memories f uh, rushing in so mm. yeah i mean if you've ever been uh, around someone who's had like moderate amnesia you know the, the stuff that doesn't put them out but does put them in like a altered mental state uh -huh. they're pretty disinhibited it's uh <laughs> they sometimes say some pretty funny stuff um, I see. Um, yeah. No, I, I, I see. You know, it's it's obvious that things like this will um, affect people, and um, it's normal. Mm. But yeah, it's it seems. Um, but in the book, it seems that people are starting to pair off. Yeah, that's. Uh, I, I was wondering what you thought about that because it, it is an interesting point that they all do seem to be pairing off. And I was I was going to note that um, I wonder what's going on with the the gender balance in this group because. Uh, initially, Lith was still leaning towards a quite heavily female cohort, but perhaps she's been remedying that uh, towards a closer fifty-fifty balance. Maybe in the more recent waking ups, but I don't know. Maybe I, I don't know. You know, maybe then, yeah. Initially, she was doing that because she wanted not didn't want to have you know competition against for uh, fighting for resources. Let's call it this way. Mm. Though it's very. Um, dehumanizing but that's what it is fighting for resources you know like if there's less females than males the males will start fighting and there might be an escalation of conflicts even further right but mm. yeah it seems that there seems to be people are starting to pair off meaning that there might be some um some sort of balancing now being done so that it is now 50 50 
Although, it feels... I mean, to be fair, like... I don't know what is Lilith thinking, and it doesn't really describe in here at all. Um, but in the same time, it feels a bit dehumanizing in the same in, in my, because if you think like, oh, if I wake up three f females and one male, okay, so maybe the same they'll be pair off, and maybe there's a chance that everybody will pair off, so there'll be no problems, no sort of like sexual mm. tension mm. Uh, related problems. Uh, but it feels like you know it. As if like Lilith is not thinking about uh, humans as humans, right? It's just like numbers, like two here, two there, and then maybe they will, you know, pair up, right? What if you no, know, so several of them don't pair up, like, and some frustrated men don't mm. try mm. to suddenly jump on other on some females, like? I feel like you know it, it's bound to happen at some point that there will be definitely one or two frustrated males that haven't been paired or paired with anyone and there's some females that don't want to pair with people and suddenly they're like uh actually come you know why aren't you pairing off you should be pairing with me or something or you know, some sort of like this sort of primal behavior mm -hmm. yeah well, i think the if you take the evolutionary psychology perspective it does seem like you know that kind of thing is fairly uh likely to happen um, if you look over like the course of history, the way societies have been structured, that kind of, um, you know, accounting for the, the reality of that situation where, you know, if, if men don't, um, I don't, know, don't have access to, to partners, then you end up fermenting violence. So, uh, the um, uh, various strategies in different societies throughout history, like the, um, uh, which empire was it? The... Uh, um, I can't remember now, but it, it, lots of different societal structures have existed mm -hmm. to sort of accommodate that fact. Uh, can you think of a specific example of what they? I, I, um, yeah, I was trying to think of something. There's, uh, it's from um, there's a bunch of stuff about this in in I think it's Francis Fukuyama's book about um, uh, different organizations of empires but I'm, I'm blanking on there's a, a an empire somewhere in the middle east that had a particularly unusual unique solution to the problem i can't for life me remember what the empire was or exactly what the configuration of fair enough but uh, you mentioned but, francis yeah, anyway. fukuyama that um, that he wrote about some um empires well we can check later on for the um and i'm sure it will come back to you eventually so uh maybe maybe <laughs> so yeah hmm. um but so let's go back to the chapter, and so this is yes. where the fun starts to uh, begin, where people are actually starting to be trying to figure out what really is going on. So two days later, mm. after this whole situation uh, occurred, Peter von Werden and six of his followers says Lilith, while a seventh follower, Derek Wolski, has to be a Polish person, doesn't it? The f Derek Wolski, Wolski, that's a Polish surname had to be him, mm. climbed up into a food cabinet as it was closing to see what's going to happen. And seeing that Lilith stopped fighting and just let it happen, you know, she knows that the Onkali will deal with him, possibly putting him back to sleep. Um, Kurt, the policeman, tells her that they want to find out what is really going on and when they want to see what their captors before they dress up as Martians and, you know, Lilith says, well, they are not Martians. It's, it's like, which Kurt interprets it like as a gotcha move, you know, it's like, ah, Gotcha, <laughs> and she's like. But then she says, "Well, they're not from. Mm. The, they're completely. They're come from a completely different solar system. One they abandoned so long ago that they don't even know if it still exists." Which makes Kurt goes like, "Ah," and then just Kurt walk yeah. away cursing. Yeah, it's uh, it's, it's interesting because Kurt seems to be falling in a bit more with the kind of the opposition to Lilith's group. Yeah, he's skeptical of the whole uh, alien scenario. I, I mean, you know, I think he still probably thinks it's like, you know, Russians versus Americans, but who mm. knows? And then, you know, that's somebody alerts Joseph, uh, which, you know, makes him to run towards the loop. But, you know, Liv is like, it's it's all good because, and then she explains the whole situation, hoping that Derek will be back, sent back to explain the situation. Mm. But we're told that unfortunately it did not happen. Uh, and to prove that... Um, that Derek didn't die. She opens all the cupboard, but he's nowhere in the side. Yeah, that seems like uh, he's just been eaten by the wall. Yeah, pretty much. As far as everyone else is concerned. Yeah. 
So some people find this very suspicious. You know, what happened to Derek? Um, Jean Pellerin demanded. He did something stupid, Lilith told her. And while he was doing it, you helped ho uh, hold me so that I couldn't stop him. Uh, Jean drew back a little, speaking louder. What happened to him? I don't know. Liar! The volume increased again. What did your What did your friends do to him? Kill him? Uh, whatever happened to him, you're partly to blame. Handle your own guilt. And because you know, she she looked around at the other equally guilty, equally accusing faces. She never would make her complaints privately. She needed an audience. So here we are. I have that one type of character that we I was always worried about. That one that only speaks up when they have you know a group of people behind their back otherwise they would keep uh, mm. keep silent right and obviously yeah. they did something stupid by putting someone in the cupboard and the cupboard disappeared and basically ending up with uh, you know in their guild and trying to shift the guild onto lilith it's like well I, you were holding me what do i what could i do fucking idiots yeah yeah it's uh, it definitely seems to be uh a kind of projection of, of the guilt onto Lilith, uh, sort of, you know, why why is, uh, you know, you kind of did this thing, right? You arranged it, you held Lilith down, you put him in the cupboard, and now you're blaming her for him disappearing. And like, no, she did kind of warn you this was not a good idea. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, for me, I mean, it's a good idea that to go check, but obviously, what did you expect? You're going to come out um out of the cupboard and then you're gonna see like little martians like little kids running around and you'll be like oh huh obviously if it is something like this happen you're gonna get overwhelmed or even beforehand you're gonna don't even have a chance to respond to what you did like right yeah yeah i mean you even could... if, it's, if, if, if it's some kind of like fake thing right yeah you're you're not likely to avoid being caught by whomever restocks the food cupboard right yeah and it's, the fun part is, it's just yeah. like, for me, it's like, he thought that maybe he will jump out onto and overwhelm the person who is on the other side, right, and, you know, trying to figure out it. But in reality, if they are observing all the time. Like, the, before mm -hmm. he even jumps on the cupboard, he would have a bug on his head, not being able to see what's going on and be back in the cell again. But, you know, it's it's mm -hmm. it was obvious that what's going to happen, uh, that eventually... Yeah. Tr well, I mean, I suppose... You know, people will eventually try something yeah right? absolutely. they've got yes. nothing else to do it's the only kind of avenue by which they might try and get out of the space so to be fair to be fair that would really help lilith if if they really send back derek uh, to the cell and he'll be like wow guys she's been telling the truth there are aliens right that'll really help her hmm. but it seems that he's not coming back yeah it's an interesting choice. I'm not quite sure why they just don't send him back. It seems like it would be the the more reasonable thing to yeah, do. Yeah, so, but... so this is the, where the chapter goes on, you know, like where, you know, Lilith just goes back to her room and as she's about to close the door, you know, Gay, Gabriel and Tate join her and, you know, start a conversation about this whole situation. Gabriel saying that, you know, Lilith losing it, but is losing this whole situation, right? She's on the losing side. And Liv's like, well, in reality, you're all losing it. If you lose, if I lose, you all lose. This, this is going to get repeated, right? And mm. they want her, well, Lilith's friends to impress them. And this is why, you know, Liv is really hoping that they will send Derek back to her, to them, because then it will really help to, you know. And um, and then we are told that Joseph told them that she can talk to Don Kali, which surprises Lilith. And he explains himself that her enemies are growing numbers, whereas she is lo whereas she is losing the uh, number of allies having around her. And in reality, those people out there are idiots, but they need a savior, like you know, as the books say, the Moses that will someone to save them, someone to give them hope, not someone to logically explain stuff. Hmm. And they say there are some potential allies, and this is where. A bit bothers me. Do you remember the Victor Dominic, the per first person who um, uh, was mentioned in the very first chapter that she was given the choices of people that she described, Victor Dominic. And mm -hmm. if I remember correctly, he was ready. He he was the one to say that the moment he has a chance, he's gonna kill everyone. Yeah, I think. Well, kill all, uh, all the captives. Yeah, yeah. It's just I think so. feels to me like. Um, 
him being an ally is a bit... Uh... Eh, well, I mean, you know, uh, he might be useful. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> unless he jumps basically and starts trying to kill everything that he sees. But the other people... Are... Yeah, I mean, I suppose there's a difference between um, you know, threatening to kill everyone who's kind of like kept you in solitary for an extended period of time mm-hmm. and like threatening to kill another group of people who you kind of like know and have interacted yeah. with and are not like your jailers yeah yeah. so you know, oh yeah he may be you know not filled with homicidal rage <laughs> hopefully fingers crossed <laughs> hopefully yeah with any luck with any luck <laughs> so the other people um that are supposed to be her eyes that leah and the guy who attacked her and now was sleeping her ray ordway beatrice mm. etc but they all, but they say she needs to hurry up because some people are starting to shift their alliances already because Beatrice was seen with sleeping with one of the guys from the other side. Uh, she was, you know, mm. so which Lily comments, well, realities can change according to people who are sleeping with her. Huh? And mm. Gary's like, so what? So you don't trust anybody? So you wind up in the pieces on the floor? I mean, you know, it's it's a valid point, but at the same time, it's if if sleeping with someone is already enough for you to shift the alliance i don't think it's a valid supporter well uh yeah but i mean the, as yet there are not sort of particular committed oh groups, no no absolutely right? in so this circumstances be... yes you're absolutely right they're yeah. not committed to yeah. anything but it, hmm. you know it's um but they have also, but Gabriel and Tate do have a right in here that she needs to really get something done that they actually think of her as a savior instead of like logically explaining stuff. And hmm. yeah, and so it's interesting that because so Tate says uh, if they had a brain between them, they'd shut up and open their eyes and ears until they had some idea of what was really going on, which is more or less what we said last. What exactly uh, what Joseph says, was, in fact, when he woke up. Yes. So. Mm. and it, you know, as the sensible strategy and we, we kind of thought that Tate wasn't necessarily doing that as well as uh, she should be yeah. or could be um, but it does seem here that like uh, Lilith uh, rather uh, Tate and Gabriel are kind of throwing in with Lilith a, with a bit more um, weight in it that actually there are yeah a bit more surety yeah, yeah. Mm. so uh, it seems like they they're taking her side. I think um, I don't know if I don't know necessarily that they think. Yeah, it's hard to say whether or not they think she's ultimately going to win or not, uh, or if you know, like her her backers in the O and Carly are. But it seems mm-hmm. like perhaps they're siding with her for that reason. But they are definitely concerned about what's going on with the other group that's forming. You know, Gabriel calls them Lilith's enemies explicitly. Yeah, gathering gathering allies, which. You know, immediately frames things in an adversarial uh, manner. Yeah, yeah. Uh. I see. This is the one thing like um, that bothers me and Don Ka- about Don Kali. They they realize that you no know, N- Nikan says you know you have to be the leader. You have to be the leader. You have to mm. lead them. You know, blah blah. You have to show them you're the leader. It's like okay, cool. Show them against what? We're in the close in the four by four room. There's nothing there. They have nothing to do. They don't trust me. They, I keep saying them, but it's, I'm one person. I have no evidence except for what they seem like. I mean, usually, if a state says they had any brain between them, they would know. Yeah. But some people are just not convinced with facts. You, they need they need to hmm. experience it by themselves. So, hmm. and I mean, and even here, they just have they don't have facts as such. They just have kind of a, an account of things. Yeah. The, and not yeah, nor do they have a particular purpose. And so it relates back to the um, another psychology experiment, a lot of psychology stuff this week. But um, <laughs> the, the, the the robber's cave experiment. Explain what um, it is. By, Tell uh, me. Uh, I can't remember his name. Um, but yes, yeah, so the robber's cave experiment was done somewhere in the mid fifties, mm-hmm. where they took um, like it was twenty two. Um, around about 11 year old boys or white from Oklahoma I think uh, and they sent them to like a summer camp thing and split them into two groups um, and they put them in two different like spots in this kind of park okay right? uh, and immediately they uh, like once they encountered the existence of this other group they learned of the existence of the other group they kind of developed an adversarial relationship between them 
um, and they identified like con- uh, they uh, developed contrasting group identities so one group was like the kind of the um like the proper boy scout polite upstanding kind of group and the other group was like the kind of rough and tumble uh, cursing kind of group and they had this like contrasting identity and they would you know fight with one another over resources and stuff and like the the idea had been like what does it take to provoke some kind of conflict between these two groups and it didn't require the any reason. result was that dividing them into two was groups enough. was enough to generate conflict oh, between two groups shit. wow okay <laughs> yeah um but uh and you know they, they did manage they did a few different like parts in this experiment and one of the things was they like um there was a water pump where they all got their water and they had that they kind of um like fake broke this and everyone had they had to like come together to fix the pump Mm -hmm. so when there was some kind of shared resources that was uh, that was needed for them to to both get on with their thing they might you know put aside some group differences and get on with it but um uh, there were other things that were kind of not successful at bringing them together um but yeah interesting experiment that really um explains a lot the current political uh, situation as well on around the world. You just need to separate people into different groups and they will fight no matter what. There won't be any conversation. Man, that just really opens your eyes on the situation, doesn't it? Huh. Well, I mean, it, it, it does depend on what... I mean, like, so part of the reason for the conflict was, that, you know, there's some kind of scarce resources yeah. where it, it, there was a certain amount of uh, zero-sum competition between those two groups where, you know, if, if one of them got whatever this resource was the other one didn't have it so that that dynamic is what produces the conflict right whereas if they have some positive something to do where they both benefit they'll they'll get on like with the water Mm -hmm. pump yeah interesting that's very interesting and as it applies to to this scenario in the book right the 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 group is these groups are kind of sorting themselves out into two separate yeah um entities and now they're starting to be in in conflict with one another uh, possibly along the lines of whether or not they believe Lilith. So, how many do you think? How many humans are there currently in total? Awaken. Is there forty now? In um, I think so. Ten, twenty. Yeah, I think we must be. I think this last ten brings us to somewhere in the region of thirty. Okay. Because now think about it. So imagine the two groups, right? You have the Peter, whatever his name is with the leading as the mm. group, the opposing group, there's Lilith, right, with the another group. So now mm-hmm. we assume, we can assume that the Lilith's group is smaller than the other one. There's probably another faction that's perhaps a number of people who are still not unsure of what the, they can they think of it. So they're like, oh, well, you know, whatever. Yeah, the, the undecided. But then think about it. Well, for us, it's easy to think of because we know that Lilith has super strength and, you know, and reflexes and everything, right? So you have mm-hmm. literally a woman who is like a Terminator, G1000, uh, <laughs> basically just in the leading group. So if they had to do anything, they would all have to had to gang up on Lilith to, to, to achieve anything, right? Yeah. So... The, the Lilith sides, right? If they had to fight, I would, they would have to do everything to make sure that the Lilith isn't ganged up upon, and then they win. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. Uh, although, I mean, the other thing is just like you've all clearly been captured by, and now most of you have kind of experienced or had first-hand account of the this like advanced technology suspension pod things that you were in. Mm-hmm. And you're in a room with someone who is kind of a representative of whatever this force is that's holding you. Um, like it seems like a sensible strategy, at least initially, to side with them or at least appear to, yeah, but- right? Because I think showing obvious opposition to that is probably not going to end well for yeah, you. Yeah, but Richard, we've discussed this before. Like it's it just shows like you no, know, and what Tate says, like it's not really feasible those people are not using their brain Hmm. so as much as logical can we can be like it's not going to happen right 
So yeah. and I get the distinct impression that Lilith feels the same way about that, and that she's very resigned. Yeah, about she's like, just like, oh, God damn it, why are these people? Not? Yeah, I think that's the problem. Yeah. She's like, oh well, you know, what do you want me to do about this? Like, they're not gonna believe me unless I, you know, on Kali appear. But you know, they're not gonna appear, so might as well just you know continue doing. This. She's just like, well, yeah, whatever. Yeah, it's like I, I'd hoped they might be reasonable enough to do yeah. what Tate is saying that they should be doing if they had any sense, um, but apparently they're not. So sigh um now what and gabriel says you know you gotta start uh shoring up your allegiances yeah. and which is sensible yeah. Yeah. so this is the reality. yeah so this is where you know the chapter ends sort of you know like where i live is like you know it's so stupid isn't it like it's like let's play americans against the russians again i know mm. and gabriel is like well talk to your friends maybe they when well, no, that's not the show that's not the show they had in mind. Maybe they'll help you rewrite the script. And she's just like looking mm. at him, frowning. Do you really talk like that? And he goes like, whatever <laughs> works. And that's that oh, chapter. Yeah. No, I, but he has mm. a point, right? It mm -hmm. would really require only just Nikanj to appear or several Onkali appear. They'd be mm. like, yeah, these are aliens. You ready? Yeah, and I think he, he's uh, right about having... Um... A narrative right a frame for which people can use to think yes. about the situation so yes if if her allies can appropriately reframe things away from whatever group conflict narrative um the uh the others are trying to push uh, onto something less likely to be destructive than, i think i uh, think that that lack of um response of Don Kali to Lilith is going to hmm. bring a a disaster and it'll eventually there will have to be an intervention between Don Kali and uh, humans hmm. to, to separate the whole situation because I think um, I will tell my chapter 11 prediction and I'll tell you why I think so hmm. so the chapter 11 prediction is that Lilith will try to speak to Don Kali because she knows they're listening at all times to get help with the people with the humans but there won't be any response, right? The Onkali will continue mm. trying to see if Lilith can pull it off, but obviously she's not going to able because there's no reason behind for them, for all the rest of the humans to believe Lilith, right? There's not really, there's only some circumstantial evidence that, you know, she can modify walls and blah, et cetera, et cetera. But like, it's still not enough for them. So, and that sort of lack yeah. of uh, response from Don Kali is going to bring a disaster. There's going to be something happen and Don Kali will have to uh, basically, you know, tranquilize the people to, to you know, to, to control the situation. Okay. I think this is, this is like where this is going to lead. Like eventually there's going to be like, oh, you know, um, the, the groups are only finally like, there's enough support for Peter and his lackeys and basically they're gonna mm -hmm. try to gang up on Lilith it's gonna be like you know um there's gonna be some infighting Lilith's gonna break a few bones or um uh, uh and then eventually people realize how actually inhuman she is in some way mm -hmm. and basically there's gonna be like well this is this can't go on and then they will really jump on her like and then suddenly on Kali are gonna realize that the mistake they're making and uh they're gonna intervene okay right uh um, you can't say anything not gonna say much about the predictions yep as always <laughs> damn it but yeah i, I like the speculations i hate, Interesting I hate you so much for remembering every single time not to <laughs> spill your beans like it's just so infuriating like this one no, I worry I'm gonna like tip my hand by by behaving differently <laughs> when you get things right or not right. It's, You're yeah. too good at this. Like honestly, too good at this. I would be like, if I was in your situation, I would be like, well, mm -hmm, you would like to know, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, um, do we have anything else? No, I think these two chapters oh, were pretty pretty short and you know self-explanatory. Mm. There wasn't much science behind them, but I think the next. A bit more social yeah, psychology. Yeah, this is more like social psycho uh, social psychology and more like interactions between the people and what's the situation, you know, what's the current development and the situation in the, between the people, you know. But I think next, I don't know, next two chapters, are we going to cover the next two chapters? I think maybe one. 
I think I think it's just one next time because it's quite a long okay. chapter. Then um, I think this is like where the stuff is going to be really um, breaking down. Like the stu- is, is, is this is like what chapter eleven? Nursery has fifteen 11. chapters, so maybe not yet the big stuff is going to happen. But I think next chapter, if it's big, there's definitely some going to be some development um, between mm. the people. But I feel like the later on chapters, there's definitely going to be some like almost disaster happening. Okay, right then. In that case, uh, that's uh, wrap yeah. up for this episode. Thank you, everyone, for listening. We're in the thesis. I almost said Zeno Genesis again. Um, if you'd <laughs> like to find where the episodes are, go to xenothesis.com. All the uh, web, the, all the places we submit our recordings are there. I was Michael Glinka. I was Richard Acton. Bye. Goodbye.